Good morning. In the interest of time, I'm going to start three minutes ahead to introduce Naveen, uh, our speaker. Uh, this is a very important day. It's a day that um, people realize the Game of Thrones is over, and, uh, and there was a plastic bottle involved as well. Uh, in case you don't follow it, you're not missing much in life. <clears throat> so uh, I am Krish Ramachandran. I'm the Vice Chair of Quality, Safety, and Innovation at Beth Israel and uh, Associate Professor of Anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. Uh, have done a little bit of research in uh, obesity and sleep apnea and perioperative respiratory uh, outcomes. I'm really excited that we have Naveen uh, to speak here today about morbid obesity and ambulatory surgery or ambulatory surgery in morbid obesity. Uh, Kovadis, who go, whither goes thou? Uh, Naveen is a very interesting man, maybe uh, one of the world's most interesting men. He, um, he trained in uh, CMC Velour, which is about a, 100 miles away from where I was born. And uh, I visited as a, as a medical student uh, during our intercollegiate matches. Um, extremely hot place. Uh, he trained there in both his, did his medicine and his MD anesthesia. And then, um, and then was out in the wilderness. So he's, you know, we have battlefield anesthesia. He's a, he's a master of wilderness anesthesia. Uh, out in a very remote location providing care um, for the underprivileged in India. So there's very few of us that actually say that they've done that in their lives. And after that, in uh, the late 2000s, he came over here, um, the mid 2000s, he came here to Canada and has stayed on since then. Uh, he is the medical director of uh, the Civic PACU and the clinical lead for bariatric anesthesia and the co director for the Acute Pain Fellowship. So he's a very busy man at Ottawa. Uh, right now. Uh, he is also the Vice President for Education for the International Society for Perioperative Care of the Obese Patient, and they had a, a very good symposium yesterday uh, with, uh, with Professor Kali et al. He's a very uh, productive researcher with over 60 re peer-reviewed publications and multiple talks all over the world. Uh, I think we're all going to enjoy um, this session. Uh, please, there's a few instructions. Please turn off your um, cell phone or put it on silent, and if you have questions, please hold your questions for the end, and please use the microphone. This session is being recorded. Um, no pressure on what words you speak, but just think about that as well. Thank you very much, and without further ado, Naveen Ipe. Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction, Krish. I'm Naveen Ipe from the University of Ottawa, and this is an ISCOP lecture, so the International Society for the Perioperative Care of the Obese Patient, for which I happen to be the VP for Education. The word covadis comes from a biblical reference to Paul meeting Jesus Christ on his way to Rome, and ironically asking Jesus, where are you going? This is uh, Jesus after his crucifixion and causes us to stop and think about what we are doing, where are we going with this problem that we have with obesity increasing and the use of ambulatory surgery in these patients. So in the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to try and share with you a, a perspective on how we can actually make ambulatory surgery safer for patients with morbid obesity. I have no sources of support or conflicts of interest with regards to any of the uh, matter I'm covering in this lecture. But I must confess, I do divide my time between working on the pain service and being the lead for bariatric anesthesia. So you will find me leaning towards pain management often and also to what we have actually done in bariatrics and how we can apply that in the ambulatory setting. To start, let me give you three patients. I'm not gonna tell you where, they, where these happened, but would be hopefully unlike patients you would care for in your ambulatory settings. So the first is a young man who has untreated sleep apnea and is, un is scheduled to undergo a uvulopalatopharyngoplasty for, as a treatment modality for sleep apnea. The second is something that happens fairly commonly in our, in our ambulatory setting, is a larger large middle-aged lady or a young lady with, who continues to smoke and is booked for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The last is somebody I'm really interested in, is an older gentleman with chronic pain, chronic opioid use. He's booked for a knee arthroscopy. And the question I ask myself, the question I ask you, is where would you think these patients, even upfront, looking at the, the little information I've given you, where should they have been done? Should they have been done in an ambulatory setting and then sent to the hospital? Which of these patients do you think actually ended up in the intensive care unit? 
So I want to go over a few aspects of the topic, and hopefully at the end we'll have a little time to discuss these cases. So the objectives of my talk are to talk mainly about preparing patients with morbid obesity for ambulatory surgery, but I want to also focus a little bit on how you can change your anesthetic and pain management in the ambulatory setting and make it safer for these patients to have surgery there. But I'm going to start with the problem, the obesity epidemic, the use of BMI to measure obesity, the problems that it brings, and how enhanced recovery and baratic anesthesia is really giving us a lot of useful information that we can use in our ambulatory settings. Again, a painting that depicts one of the first ambulatory procedures. This is probably a painting that's almost 400 years old. Speaks a lot to me. If you look at it, it's Rembrandt's painting showing Tobias returning from a journey of self-discovery and brings with him the Archangel Raphael. This is a painting that actually guided a lot of the images that followed, paintings of surgeries with an invisible source of light. There are three people around the patient. And I often tell the residents, if you can't be the archangel, at least be the bystander comfor comforting the patient. So I think there's a lot in the history that and we have come a long way from this being a cataract procedure being done about 400 years ago. As evident from these images, obesity is increasing. And what is interesting for us is these graphs are, don't seem to be flattening. In fact, in a few years' time, many populations around the world will have patients who are overweight and obese will exceed those who are not. So when we think of access to ambulatory surgery, we do have a problem, and we as a speciality do have to decide how we can go about dealing with the increasing population of obese patients and morbid obesity. The problem that we have to contend with is actually the use of BMI to measure the patient's obesity. It wouldn't surprise you that these two well-known people actually have the same BMI. It's probably because the gentleman, the lower panel, actually carries an excessive weight with his uh, height, and the gentleman, the better-known gentleman, actually has a lot of muscle mass. While these may be extremes, they just go to show that if you use BMI alone to measure obesity, you may end up in miscalculating the degree of obesity. Thanks to our colleagues in the UK who have come up with a single sheet, which with their permission is in the RCL notes that I have put there. It's also available on our ISCOP website. They're measuring the waist to height ratio. So if the waist of the patient exceeds half the height, this is a very important parameter that we should add to our assessment beyond the BMI because this is what is going to objectively give us information about central obesity and pick up things such as difficult airways. Again, going by gestalt, just looking at the patient and saying this patient in bariatrics we say is apple-shaped or android or central obesity, now we actually have a measure by which we can add to our assessment of patients and probably at a certain degree of obesity avoid patients with central obesity in the ambulatory setting. The other thing going forward, and this is something where we are going in the future, would be to actually measure cardiopulmonary physical testing. And this is starting to happen a lot in the UK and parts of Europe, which I think is where we are going with assessing obesity and the suitability for ambulatory surgery. What is interesting to me with my interest in difficult airways is actually using densitometry scans to pick up the distribution of obesity. And for example, if you see a lot of fat intrathoracic, intra-abdominal, even the surgeons may be less inclined to do these procedures because as, as evident from the gentleman in the picture here, they may have varying degrees of difficult airways and surgical difficulties that the surgeons may face with these cases. Thankfully for us, bariatric surgery has increased exponentially. And this is again an old graph, but it shows an almost tenfold increase in the number of elective bariatric procedures being done. And I come from one of the high volume bariatric centers in Canada. This gives us a cohort of patients to study. So we actually can see how not only their comorbidities improve with weight loss as shown in this infographic, but also reminds us of the common conditions or medical problems that come with obesity. Something to think about when you're actually assessing a patient with morbid obesity to find out if they're actually suitable for ambulatory procedures. One of the other things that bariatric surgery has done, and I am yet to find it move into the anesthesia literature, but would be very interested if we started to do this, is the surgeons are using the obesity surgery mortality risk score or the OSMERS score. 
it gives importance to age, BMI, the gender, hypertension, and pulmonary embolism. And this has been very well validated in large series. Unfortunately, we are not using this when we are assessing patients with morbid obesity for ambulatory surgery or even in bariatric surgery, though the surgeons are using it. Simply stated, a young woman will have about a 1 12th, or let me put it the other way, an older man with either systemic hypertension or a risk factor for pulmonary embolism will have a 12-fold mortality, so 12-fold 90-day mortality than a young woman <coughs> who does not have systemic hypertension or pulmonary hypertension. <laughs> So again, something we are, not, we are missing in our assessment of patients for ambulatory surgery. And just to show you, this has actually been well validated in, in large series of databases where it not only correlates with 90-day mortality, but it correlates with cardiorespiratory complications, length of stay, and morbidity also. So going forward, just to recap, beyond the BMI, we should look at the distribution try to use one of these validated scores and see if we can better identify patients who will be suitable for ambulatory surgery. The other aspect that I want to bring in here is the use of enhanced recovery. And when we started doing bariatric surgery, enhanced recovery has already had a 20-year lead. And we're thinking, what is enhanced recovery and how do we actually apply it in bariatric anesthesia or in patients with morbid obesity? But what I can say, and I like this statement, is that we don't really need to start looking for new elements to add to the ERAS protocols, and many of the existing ERAS elements can actually be applied into our bariatric programs. And this requires a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of adjustment, but really patients who are morbidly obese, both in ERAS, say colorectal or joints, we can use a lot of that information and see how we can improve our perioperative care and then find what actually works for the ambulatory setting. There is good guidance from actually the ERAS Society itself, and I don't expect you to be able to read that, but there is now at least one systematic review and meta-analysis to show that enhanced recovery actually works in obesity. So patients with morbid obesity can be enrolled in an ERAS program, mostly for weight loss surgery, but can be applied elsewhere. So I think this is all very important. And every time a surgeon says to me, Naveen, why can't we do this case in the ambulatory setting? I often have to remind them that the ERAS protocols are usually very well developed and very well established. As this pathway shows, you, you have to prepare not just the patient and the team and the equipment, but the protocols have to be laid out very well. Most of our ambulatory settings, at least our centers, do not have these elaborate programs and protocols. So if you're lap coli in the hospital can go home the same day, is it possible for the patient in the ambulatory setting to get the same advantage? It is, but remember, we have put a lot of effort into making that happen in the tertiary care center that we may not be able to replicate in the ambulatory setting. Sorry, I'm clicking too fast. Thanks to Ed Mariano for sharing this infographic and it's available to download. It shows the journey of the patient in an ERAS setting. And what I want to bring to your attention is the first part. You see the patient sedentary and sitting down. It's the pre-op preparation, and I will show you more information in obesity, that helps them to achieve that goal and reach home, often in a better state than they actually started off in. So I like to think of this when we say in ambulatory surgery, we want to reduce the time between intra-op and post-op. We want quick recovery and early discharge. A lot of effort has actually gone in to the ERAS protocols as shown here with a multidisciplinary approach, which if yes, we can do it, but we will have to think about how we do it in the ambulatory setting. Again, my clicking is a bit too fast. I'll slow down. Moving on to the second part of my talk, and I really like this painting from a firefighter in Edmonton, Alberta. And if you look carefully at this image, you see an invisible force or invisible person standing between the surgeon and the nurse. This, to me, captures a lot of what we do in the operating room as anesthesiologists. And often, if you're dealing with a patient with morbid obesity, you're standing there in the ambulatory setting and wondering, how did we get here? So, I think we need to take a step back and see how far we have come. You think of Rembrandt's painting, and you think of Dan Sundahl's painting, and you see we have come a long way, but we often need to just slow down and decide where we go further with this. 
So preparing patients with morbid obesity, again, a lot of information has come from our work with enhanced recovery in bariatrics. And again, I draw your attention to the McGill Department of Patient Education. If any of you are interested to know what is the best patient education information, it's freely available and they are very generous to share it with anybody who contacts them. So you can get good patient information booklets. Each one of us do, do not have to go back to reinvent the wheel and create your own patient education because as we have seen in Enhanced Recovery, an educated, engaged, and empowered patient, and that's the hashtag down there, is the one who will be able to get the benefits of ambulatory surgery and get out of the hospital or the center quickly. I want to highlight one point here on the smoking cessation. In our bariatric program, patients have to have stopped smoking for a whole year before they're even scheduled for surgery. So yes, it is possible. And I, would, I take that back to the surgeon every time we have a patient who's still smoking and is coming for elective surgery, we have achieved they themselves will not operate on a patient who is still smoking. And even if the patient says, I'm sorry, I had a panic attack and had a cigarette this morning, sorry, no surgery for you. So we have a zero tolerance in our bariatric program. And that's why I think we can do it, we can achieve it. And maybe I'm being provocative here, but I think if we decide together with our surgeons that we will not accept patients who are smoking, we can achieve it. What about obstructive sleep apnea? The OSMA score or DMARIA score does not give any importance to OSA because paradoxically, OSA, the diagnosis and treatment may actually be protective for the patient. And I'll be happy to hear our chair's opinion on that in the question time. But what we are finding is that we have got very good tools to diagnose sleep apnea. But I don't know why we are diagnosing sleep apnea outside the operating room or worse still in the recovery room. This diagnosis and management has to move from anesthesia to the surgeon's office and even further upstream, and I'll talk about it in a second. But what I want to highlight to you in the ambulatory setting for patients with morbid obesity is adding the bicarb to looking at their, even their venous bicarb. And this is known to predict not just post-op respiratory failure, but really important to look at those patients with high bicarbs and know that they will be very sensitive to opioids. Whether it predicts in, um, you know, that they're inadequate or they're non-compliant with their CPAP is controversial, but definitely watch out for patients who have sleep apnea and have high bicarb levels because these are the patients who get into trouble in the ambulatory setting. So it's one of those important things that we should think about. Now, again, there is very good guidance, and those of you who are interested to dive deep into the world of sleep apnea, and there is guidance from the ASA, from SAMBA, and the recent article from SASM. And what they actually recommend is, actually, is nicely shown here in this infographic, that if the patient has sleep apnea in a machine, you can proceed with ambulatory surgery, has sleep apnea, doesn't have a machine, and comorbidities are not optimized, do not have surgery. But where I have a problem with this is right here. If the patient has a presumptive diagnosis of sleep apnea and comorbidities are optimized and you can manage their pain with a non-opioid technique, three requirements, proceed with ambulatory surgery. And what I think is the problem with this is we are not yet able to achieve all three because unfortunately for us, opioids still remain to be a major part of our post-operative pain management in our ambulatory population. So we have to first find a way by which we can adequately and appropriately treat pain. So going back to the recommendation that if you are sure that you can manage the pain without opioids, a patient with presumed diagnosis of sleep apnea and does not have a machine should have ambulatory surgery. I am of the opinion, and I'm happy to hear your thoughts on this, is that we should not be accepting these patients for ambulatory surgery. But our treatment and diagnosis of OSA, we're going to get a new boost here. Because not only is obstructive sleep apnea good for sleep or you know, for better quality of life, there are, there's good evidence to suggest that untreated sleep apnea increases a lot of risks. Again, the impetus to diagnose and treat sleep apnea, which will make a huge difference to patients in the ambulatory setting, would come from impaired driving. There are estimates that suggest 
patients' road traffic accidents due to untreated sleep apnea exceeds impaired driving due to alcohol and distracted driving due to texting and driving. So untreated OSA is becoming a huge problem outside in society. And just as 20 years ago as a trainee, we were talking about smoking secession outside the OR. Now it's become a thing of a past. Many of our residents don't know how to give an anesthetic to a smoker, and I think it's because of the effort that has gone in, not just in anesthesia or in surgery, not just in primary prevention, but in, in society. So hopefully, looking forward, I hope that sleep apnea will also move, the diagnosis and treatment will move upstream, not at, in the recovery room or in, outside the OR, but in the GP's office. And with stop bang, we can say with confidence not just the surgeons, but the family doc should be using stop bang to screen patients for sleep apnea. This is a rather provocative infographic because we often say, what is the cost of diagnosing and, sleep, uh, and treating sleep apnea? If you forget about the workplace accidents, productivity and comorbidities, if, even if you take those out, motor vehicle accident reimbursement. And remember, if you get either the government or insurance companies involved in this, as they are starting to realize, they will be able to pay for every person with a BMI. You can decide. Everybody with a BMI over 40, which is the, for the truck drivers, have to undergo a sleep study. Because this cost, it, there will actually be a saving of about, they estimate about $10 billion if every adult with a BMI of over 40 is uh, sent for a sleep study and treated for sleep apnea. So again, I think we are going to find some help. Just as Dan Sundahl's painting had that invisible force, the problem of sleep apnea in the ambulatory setting, hopefully, I am hopeful, will find relief from this finding, that it's a huge cost to society. So now coming to the, 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 la, the, you know, the last third part of my talk is just a few things about how we can actually deal with obesity in the ambulatory setting. And the question that I'm often asked is, what is the BMI cutoff? And as I mentioned, BMI can be misleading. But especially if you work in a setting where the surgeon or the surgeon's secretary or assistant is booking the patients, deciding whether to go to the ambulatory setting or not, we as a group of, you know, this is our area of expertise, have to come up with some sort of number. We need a hard limit. And I'm going to be, again, maybe a little provocative and say, no patient above BMI of 50, irrespective of the procedure. You might say cataract or endoscopy. You can come up with guidelines in your own setting. But as a rule, a BMI over 50 should not be done in an ambulatory setting. That would be the hard limit. The soft limit would be 30. So between 30 and 50, we need to screen for the other things that we have talked about. Because we know that if you look at Benoit's curves, the position of prominence is that patient with the high body weight, which, by the way, is another interesting way of setting a cutoff. There are some centers that use 120 or 140 kilos as the cutoff for ambulatory surgery, which makes sense because then they have tables, stretcher, help, you know, all those things in place, which is another way of going about it. It's just that if we abandon BMI, we may actually lose a lot of the research that has gone on and is still going on as a metric to predict any change that we institute. So again, I leave it at that, but you know, we are seeing a lot of changes. We need our patients to get up and get out and as seen with enhanced recovery, we are able to do this for our patients with obesity. I like this parking sign from New York City because a lot of our bariatric patients come to us and they feel like this, that they were not welcome. And I think discussions like this, dialogue like this, can help us to make them feel welcome if we can do it safely in the ambulatory setting. And with better monitoring, I think patients may not need to go to a monitored area, may not need to go to the ICU, but we have to be very careful. I see a lot of promise in end tidal monitoring in the ambulatory setting also, so that you can actually pick up patients who are hypoventilating or having these periodic apneas that become a big problem. We'll talk a little bit about multimodal strategies, and I'll show you a couple of them that is not just piling more against to balance the obesity, but it's actually shifting the balance with more safer uh, outcomes. Again, too fast. Obesity anesthesia. Now, equipment. 
You need to have, you know, we, we could talk all day about equipment, expertise and experience. And I don't know how it is in your setups where you have these hybrid ambulatory settings and sometimes you send the most junior anesthetist there or sometimes in some centers they send the most senior most anesthetist to the ambulatory setting. It's, it's controversial and I don't want to dig too deeply into that, but you can have a list of five lap coles and you have one patient say with that BMI of 50 and that can derail the whole process. So the ambulatory settings are often built for efficiency and you really have to take a step back and decide, is this going to actually get in the way of achieving that? With the NAP4 report was about difficult airways. Again, you need to think about obesity being a problem. NAP5 was about depth of anesthesia. So again, these are problems that are highly common or very prevalent in the patients with morbid obesity. I'm gonna just briefly touch on pain management because as I said, that is one of those if you can manage pain well. And going back, we have a tendency to use short-acting opioids because we are really worried about you know, patients not waking up or patients with obesity. And a lot of us have used or still use remifentanil. But I really want to show you just a little bit about dexmedetomidine, which has changed our anesthetic practice in morbid obesity. So in bariatrics, we would almost exclusively use intraoperative dexmedetomidine. Ketamine and lidocaine are also very useful, but if you're really running a ketamine infusion in an ambulatory setting, I think that patient should not have been there because you're doing something that is exquisitely painful that you don't want to use an opioid but using ketamine. So dexmedetomidine may be that happy middle place where you can use it safely. One of the earlier studies, and again, I like to use earlier studies because once you get into the era of enhanced recovery in bariatrics, very difficult to show a change. So here is a very old, about a 10-year-old study that showed patients who get dexmedetomidine, and you look at their quick awakening, very little pain, you know, their opioid requirement post-operatively, and this is laparoscopic surgery, something like what you want to do in your <laughs> ambulatory settings. Again, another study showing patients who get dexmedetomidine. This was, again, a retrospective control, so not the greatest design, but they really show that if you bring in dexmedetomidine into your practice, you can reduce both your nausea rates, nausea and vomiting, fitness to discharge, and patients have very low opioid requirements. So in the world of bariatrics, we often will say dexmedetomidine is your obesity slash OSA friendly anesthetic. So all your patients in your ambulatory setting, if appropriate, should be getting a drug like this rather than opioid. So you can go towards what I'll show you next is opioid free anesthesia. Again, something that is being talked about a lot in obesity and it is possible to do and what a major selling point is actually the lack of nausea and vomiting. So really your pain scores may not be different, but your anti-emetic, which again is one of the major reasons for delayed discharge or failure to meet discharge. Um, again, TIVA with depth of anesthesia monitoring after the NAP5 is something we should do. Colleagues of mine, friends in the audience who don't like us not to mention regional techniques, if you can do a regional technique for a patient with morbid obesity, this is again from our RCT where we were doing intraperitoneal local anesthetic. Didn't show a big difference, but again, patients had very little pain even in the control group. Now with the use of ultrasound, we can actually find that patients, uh, are, you are able to do even spinals in patients with morbid obesity. Controversial, whether you would do a spinal for a knee scope, uh, in a patient with obesity to avoid the GA and happy to hear your thoughts on it. Again, ultrasound has really brought regional back into the ambulatory settings and a lot of procedures are being done with, again, able to reach that opioid free or opioid sparing. But important to think what if the block doesn't work? So if you take a patient and I can give you examples of dialysis fistulas in patients uh, who were really not appropriate for the ambulatory setting, even though the regional anesthetic. So um, the location of the ambulatory uh, center is very, very important. And um, I think in Ottawa, at least, and many of you have this, you have a standalone private clinic that's not connected to the big hospitals. You have an affiliated and connected. So you have an ambulatory center that is connected to the <coughs> big hospitals. Or like us, you may have an ambulatory center that's integrated into the tertiary care center. And I think this model really works very well for us. And I, as uh, shown, the, the hospital in the middle is the ambulatory center. It's about two kilometers from the tertiary hospital on the top and 10 kilometers from the 100-year-old hospital at the bottom where I work. But I can tell you, that ride in the ambulance is going to be the worst experience of your life. 
I have had colleagues who have had to call 911 to transport a patient from that ambulatory service center to the hospital to go to the ICU. And that is something we really want to avoid. Maybe we will deny some of our patients surgery in the ambulatory service just because we are not sure that they will meet discharge criteria. So the integrated system is really good because you can take a patient with obesity, untreated OSA, or whatever your problems are, in the tertiary level hospital, if they meet discharge criteria, they can go home in the evening. If they need to stay overnight, they can do that. If they need ICU, unfortunately, we can, you do have access to it. So one of the major deciding factors is how accessible is an intensive care unit in deciding whether a patient with morbid obesity can have ambulatory surgery and their comorbidities. So I think uh, we could look at these cases because we have about another 10 minutes. I'm, I would like to take some questions also, uh, but let's go with the easiest one. Who do you think required to stay overnight? I mean, obviously anybody could have, but just looking straight up at these, the little information that is on there, there's one patient who woke up coughing, bronchospasm, DSAT, nebulized, then started having pain, then opioids, not meeting discharge criteria. The lab coli. And sorry, again, clicking faster than I should, but it doesn't work well in a lecture like this. The patient who got admitted is the chronic pain patient. All red flags. This patient had poorly controlled pain, was on a ton of opioids, was having a knee arthroscopy that went on from being a diagnostic to some sort of meniscus and something. So again, the ambulatory center closes at 6 p.m. He's not meeting criteria, doesn't need to be reintubated. His pain is just not controlled. You did a block for him, put him in the ambulance and sent him to the hospital. The first patient is the most unfortunate of them all, an untreated OSA patient having surgery in the airway. And that is one thing I didn't talk about is what surgical models are suitable for the ambulatory setting. And from what I read or looked for, there's little information other than we should avoid airway surgeries in these patients. This patient required to be reintubated from bleeding and swelling and really had a rocky stay in the ICU after that. So again, airway surgery, untreated OSA is now almost exclusively done in the in the main hospital itself. Many of these patients remain intubated for a few hours and are extubated. The surgery itself is a 20 or 40 minute procedure, but it is a huge deal in a big patient with untreated OSA. So the way forward, where do we go? Where do our patients go? A couple of references there and the, the book in the middle is the more recent one. A couple, some of us from ISCOP have chapters there. A lot of the information that I've covered in this lecture is there. And I think we need to think about how we can actually screen our patients. And again, I would say between 30 and 50, we should screen our patients for sleep apnea. Only those who have diagnosed and treated should have surgery in the ambulatory setting. Again, the OSMRs, OSMRS may be a useful predictor of postoperative complications. Patients with high OSMRS scores should be done in the main setting, in the main hospital. Enhanced recovery has given us prehabilitation, patient preparation. Why can't we do it for the ambulatory setting also? Why are these patients coming for ambulatory surgery with no information, with no preparation? And many of them are not even mobile. So how are they going to even get up and go home? So we need to think about all the things that enhanced recovery has done for us. And again, we can talk a lot about the anesthetics itself, but basically our opioid sparing techniques, the use of dexmedetomidine regional, et cetera. And Time for another consensus statement, but again, we need to start putting these things into our practice and studying how they change our outcomes for our patients. I thank you for your interest. I hope you have some questions. I'd invite you to join our society and come visit, travel with us. These are some of the meetings where we will be at this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naveen. That was a very informative talk, and I have a few questions for you, but you had one for me. Uh, I'm going to wait till, the, till others have had a chance to, to ask questions to answer that. Roman. Uh, 
I'm Roman Schumann from Boston at Tufts. Thanks, Naveen, for, for really a great comprehensive overview and um, being also very open about some of the lack of evidences that we have that sort of decreases our armamentarium to have um, reasons for not doing something or for doing something when we talk to other specialty colleagues like surgeons, GI folks. So one of the big issues I think that a lot of people are having is we have a machinery where we help with GI procedures now all the time in ambulatory settings. And many folks are discussing, well, should there be a BMI cutoff? What should it be? It's just some propofol and then they go home. How do you, how do you approach that? Thank you very much for that question. And um, I think one of the other aspects that if you are starting with changing the way you're practicing is to have an estimate of how much pain that procedure is, is associated with. So, for example, the question that's often asked is, what about a cataract in a patient with a BMI of 51, when you say 50 is the cutoff? So I think in cataracts, there's a very good criteria. The patient has to be able to lie flat, and without sedation should have, uh, that, you know, have a procedure without sedation. So to answer your question about GI scopes, if you have a patient with a high BMI who is already got, say, inflammatory bowel disease and has pain, you know from your experience those are the patients who are going to have pain post-op. Again, it will take, okay, let me ask you a question in return. Does it have to be a morbidity and mortality before you change practice? And we all are trying to draw a line, not in the gray zone, but a little further away and saying, do we have to wait till somebody, you know, we had a patient who died in the lithotripsy unit before anesthesia was involved. Right? Nobody knew. You hear about the disasters in colonoscopy. Again, patient deeply sedated with whatever cocktail of drugs. Some of these patients are not able to go home. So maybe, again, Krish can add in here, maybe we can come up with some sort of consensus that will again <coughs> consider the post-operative pain in the procedure before we accept or deny. But personally, I think we need to take a stand and say there is a BMI cutoff beyond which no procedure should be done outside a hospital with access to an ICU. I, I, just to tag on to that, I, th I think the, the people who book these cases are not clinicians, right? I mean, there's a, exactly. there's a decision made that the procedure needs to be done, and then it's the schedulers who book these procedures. And so uh, guidelines are important, but understanding that workflow, what it is, and ensuring that you've got your your um, your hard stops for where these patients are sent is important. Actually, in our unit, our GI unit is is within the hospital, like the the first model that you said, uh, and we take care of patients who have BMIs. Uh, I see Simon Robson here. You know, um, we take care of patients with BMIs of greater than 50 almost regularly. It's bread and butter stuff for us now, and it's hairy. I mean, you get you get to manage these very sick patients uh, and their airway management is not straightforward. Um, the, the overall safety for you know, deep sedation in these patients is actually excellent. Um, Kazarian published a, a very large study uh, looking, at, um, looking at a nationwide uh, inpatient sample and outpatient surgery for morbid obesity, um, so airway surgery for morbid obesity. I think that'll be a, a good reference to add to the discussion that you just had. The safety margin for airway events and cardio, cardiopulmonary events was actually incredibly good. I mean, it was talking about tends to, I mean, I think Roman and I did this at uh, a couple of ASAs back. Uh, so I think it's, it's challenging because the outcomes data don't necessarily reflect our concerns, which, which is something that we grapple at SASM. Uh, is this because clinicians are going the extra length and taking care of these patients in different ways and it's tough, but we're doing the right things and patients come out doing okay? Is it because these procedures are less painful and, uh, and therefore they do fine? Uh, I don't know the right answers because these are all retrospective data. Um, I'll come back to the sleep apnea question uh, after we've had uh, these, but the, I think this is a very good discussion and, and in reality we don't have much skin in the game or power to change uh, the decisions around what thresholds. I think for our standalone centers, it's 50 for the endoscopy units that are standalone. Um, 
So say on the same lines, our bariatric surgeon actually likes to do endoscopies on almost every patient about six weeks before he schedules them for bariatric surgery, and they look for gastritis and essentially rescope the patient on the day of surgery, and if there's gastritis, they cancel it. So essentially, we get every bariatric surgery patient for an endoscopy. And we've developed a protocol that seems to be very effective and safe, and it is avoiding propofol to the minimum, but use a combination of ketamine and dexmedetomidin. And most patients just require 20 to 40 milligrams of, of propofol, really, to actually get the scope in. And uh, the, uh, the introduction of high, uh, high flow oxygen therapy has been extremely useful in patients with obstructive sleep apneas. So um, I, I have used that for some of my patients who were on the higher end of uh, the BMI above 50. And while the surgeons were begging to intubate the patient, I was not really willing to intubate the patients. And we've very successfully uh, sedated them with high flow oxygen therapy because, as we know, it not just oxygenates, but it also takes care of the carbon dioxide. And I think we should start considering some of these modalities uh, when we actually sedate our patients for endoscopies. And we really, um, I think we are in a much safer for zone right now with, with the technology that we have compared to before. But I think we have to be extremely mindful of the drugs we use and how we use it. And use of non-sedative drugs is probably the primary. <coughs> Ketamine is a great analgesic, so really, we don't need to use opioids in these patients, even if it's a painful procedure. 20 to, uh, personally, I use 20 to 50 milligrams of ketamine in almost every patient. Uh, there are a very, very few patients where there may be a delayed discharge from the PACU, but it's only a very small percentage, really. So something to be considered. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I mean, uh, Roman, Anu, and uh, Chris, you brought up a good point. Is anesthesia being in and available? Because there's a huge difference between the GI docs pushing the limit on the BMI and reaching a point where it's not safe. So in our hospital, BMIs over 40 come into the hospital for endoscopy and colonoscopy, and over 50, one of us has to be there. So I think, as one of my colleagues you said, that you know, if you're not at the table, you'll be at the, on the menu, and they'll call you only after things go bad. So again, we need to uh, decide what is safe to be done where. So. Thank you very much for your presentation. Derek Sakata, University of Utah. So I run multiple ambulatory surgery centers. One of them has an emergency department in it. One of them does not. One has a BMI 40, one has a 50. I know Josie's uh, uh, abstract last year would say a 45 uh, in his abstract last year. One of the things I'm concerned about is that uh, my providers, my uh, proceduralists, will make statements like this. Well, Derek, you've got an ED over here, so it's OK. Mm -hmm. or uh, our nurses are ACL is trained, so it's okay. It's like, do you really want to go there? Is that the final end point that you're going to make a decision when we do these cases? Mm -hmm. So at Utah, we've been, we've been working on ways in which we can do anesthesia safer. So I I'm looking for answers, right? So pharmacologically, we've been experimenting and published on inhaled ester-based drugs, Remy Fentanyl and Remy Manslam. These drugs break apart in the bloodstream if you're not breathing. So opposite of what we think of inhaled anesthetics, and we've shown that works. Our latest paper will be in pigs to show that it doesn't affect uh, the alveoli. The other device we're coming out with on the engineering side is a new nasal cannula that will allow you to get a standard nasal cannula, allow you to get the patient up to an end tidal oxygen of 70%, as well as give you a capnograph that's as pristine as it would be in, a non, in an intubated okay. patient. So we're working in these areas, and then the question is, can we combine the two to give an ester-based inhaled anesthetic? The patient can demand dose themselves for sedation, and then also uh, predict their breathing. So we've got to get on top of this, because my surgeons are pushing me, my GI docs are pushing me, and I really appreciate your talk, so thank you very much. Thank you, and I, I just want to add is that as we explore advances, both in pharmacology and monitoring and in caring for these patients, <laughs> We need to remember that in referral hospitals and tertiary care, it's different when it is in a small community hospital out in the periphery. And if we as a group can decide that these are safe cutoffs, not for us, but for elsewhere. And that's the problem we have. A university hospital in Canada, they say, oh, you do up to a 50 BMI, but we did it you know, in the 100 kilometers away and we got into trouble. So again, different levels of care access to different you know, modalities. And uh, I think we, we still have work to do, but I appreciate your comment on you know, innovation and making it safer. 
Um, I want to take the opportunity to bring up the sleep apnea piece, which is a big part of the, uh, the challenge that we have for ambulatory surgery. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out is that metabolic syndrome, which is a big part of the, uh, you know, the risk cate uh, characterization of the high-risk patient, is really indistinguishable from sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a disease manifestation of metabolic syndrome. Um, one-fourth of our adult males and one-tenth of our adult women will have sleep apnea. Um, so uh, I think deciding not to do them in ambulatory centers is probably a step uh, to separate or too far away from the reality of how our work, uh, work actually happens. Um, so going back to what the gentleman from Utah said, the, the issue is around, and what Dr. Wadwa said as well, is around how we manage the perioperative care um, of the patient for these procedures. How do you screen for them? And I think uh, societies can get together and build easier frameworks for, um, for decision making, and I think that's important to do in this uh, coming year. A uh, couple of other things which are um, relevant to the discussion. You brought up care coordination, which is really key. Most hospitals in America don't have care coordination preoperatively because there's no revenue model for it. Um, and most hospitals in Canada, you have the time for that, but I don't know if you have the, the, the connected resources for that sort of thing to happen. So we're all, you know, in this sort of funny zone where we have patients who are unmanaged or unprepared, underprepared, and we have to make a decision for surgery, um, and, and, that's, and that's tough. If you're in a center which forces you to do surgery, you end up doing something you regret later. If you're in a center that's okay with you canceling on the day of surgery, you end up being a numerator, you know, either way on a, on a metric that uh, the hospital follows. I'll just jump in here and yep. just say that in our bariatric program, and I was talking to somebody in, in Boston, we have 100% compliance with both the non-smoking and the diagnosis and treatment of OSA. So if we have been able to bring that into our bariatric programs, I don't see why our joint replacements and our gynecologist doing hysterectomies are the two models where we have obesity and smoking and untreated OSA. So we are using the bariatric model as it is possible to quit smoking and get treated for OSA because those are the patients who are skewing the results for those enhanced recovery protocols. So I think we can yeah. do it, Krish. This I is, think we can definitely, do it. Definitely, you know, it's, it's, and that's the key challenge, is I think, you know, who coordinates and how that decision is made. Uh, because a year before surgery, we really, you know, don't have contact with patients uh, in our current models. Uh, Mark Oringer, who was at the University of Michigan, built a very successful esophageal surgery program. Uh, he is of all the people in the history of esophageal surgery, the father of ERAS, and is not mentioned at all, because he's, his lab used to make sure that his patients worked, uh, or his clinic, uh, two miles a day, and, and did not smoke for at least 30 days before esophageal cancer surgery, at a time when nobody was talking about this, right? They used to ensure that they had, uh, they had you know, beef broth or whatever it was for protein as well. So he was ahead of the times doing this, and his postoperative respiratory complication rates were under 1%. But he's under a lot of, there was a lot of critique of this approach because in America, their patient rights groups feel that this is coercion for uh, a something, for an addiction, and you penalize people for an addiction to nicotine. So it, it is a complicated issue to say you will, you will withhold service if you're, if you're still uh, smoking, but it's an important conversation to be had. Did you have any thoughts on the cost? It's good to have an expert as the moderator because I get to ask him a question. Yeah. The cost of testing and treating. I know it's very yeah. dramatic to show infographics so, that actually shows you save money if you so treat everybody. I, so actually, it's a great point. Uh, when and I'm not I'm not a Democrat or Republican. If you're recording this, you should probably shut the recording at this point. Um, but when the last government took over uh, in in in, in uh, the U.S they changed a very important public safety uh, rule that came in that every truck driver could only hold their license if they had a sleep study and they and they'd shown that they didn't have sleep apnea. It's actually active in Canada right now. Um, and if they were positive for sleep apnea, that, that they had to show that their treatment was adequate before they could get their license back. That was one in the, in the whole sort of list of things that was deregulated when uh, the Trump government took over. Um, that was one of the things that, that went away. 
And, and so I think it's complicated because there's a lot of factors involved in who makes, uh, you know, what, what the drivers are for change. I, I think at, across networks and in your world across provinces, people have to understand the, the, uh, uh, what the actual costs are for treatment or non-treatment. And the reality is, like you said, the outcomes after sleep apnea are surprisingly better in many, in many situations, probably because people are taking much better care of those high-risk patients. Uh, economic modeling needs to happen uh, for long-term outcomes. And I know that Francis's group has done some work on long-term outcomes in untreated apnics and those that are picked up uh, as apnics or high risk of apnea. Um, it's part of the work that we do at SASM. And I, I think, again, I'm going back to saying, I think these are all opportunities for societies to work together to come up with better um, guidelines for, uh, for governments and for uh, networks, hospital networks. Um, hello, my name is Peggy Duke. I'm a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist from Emory Atlanta, Georgia, uh, for a long time. Um, I, as a full disclosure, I'm an unpaid consultant for a company that now has a minute ventilation monitor that's been shown to have incredible accuracy for giving information that are direct ventilation metrics. Have any of you seen this, looked at it? Do you see this as being something, if you had something other than entitled CO2 and SpO2, um, that allows you to have true ventilation metrics as being something that could be useful in, a son of, uh, in some of your um, patient population? So to answer your question, we do not have access to that monitor, but we are starting to get end tidal measured from nasal cannula, which is at least picks up the apnea, if not the absolute amount of minute ventilation. Our nurses are very happy to use the old uh, impedance plethysmography to count the respiratory rate and pick up apnea that way. We have a very low threshold to get our respiratory therapists to hook up a patient because, again, I really feel bad when I'm making a diagnosis of sleep apnea in the recovery room. I think uh, something has been missed along the way. But again, I have, I'm not afraid to call the respiratory therapist and say, we have a patient who's having pain for work of breathing, we would like to do the CPAP. So uh, to answer your question, no, we don't have any of those advanced monitors, but counting the respiratory rate is something simple and measuring the CO2. Actually, our institution just bought three monitors uh, about two weeks ago, and they were able to early discharge three patients during the last two weeks. And I just heard from Respiratory Motion yesterday that the institution ordered 25 more monitors. So it's definitely an advance that we can use maybe for early discharge, especially in ambulatory surgeries. And my, um, under I, I mean, one of my questions also is that we could also probably put these monitors on while we are inducing the patients and look at the response to opioids, and that would be one of that could be one of the determinants of how sensitive to opioids they might be. So there may be a value, uh, much value in one, in these monitors. Thank you. And I'm not paid by them. Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, close the session with one thought around monitoring. It, monitoring is important if you change your treatment. If you want to change outcomes with monitoring. The monitoring should change your diagnosis, and the treatment of the diagnosis should change the outcomes. Otherwise, monitoring just adds to the data and the noise that you have around patient care. And, and that's, you know, I, I just want to close with that to say there's more to come. We, we need to uh, develop better techniques of understanding the disease condition that uh, is associated with worse outcomes. And right now, we're really at the infancy of that understanding. Thank you all. Thank you very much.